hello everyone. My name is Lani Deheck, and I am. I can you think about this? I am with Midmar right now, uh, as having been seconded from the British Columbia Nurses Union to help work on uh, implementing the WDA grant or the Workforce Development Grant uh, across. Uh, British Columbia, but also helping on the federal project. So I'm very grateful for this opportunity uh, that Midmar has provided me and the BC Nurses Union. As well, I'm on the board of the CSPDM, which we are bringing you this webinar from. And so on behalf of the board, thank you for joining us this morning. I am speaking a little slower and a, a little louder today. And that's because our guest presenter, Irene, has a hearing deficit. And she has asked that I share that with you so you understand that as well. Uh, so there, uh, she will uh, ask me to repeat if I've, if I've spoken a little too softly or she hasn't quite heard what I've said. So before we get started, a few housekeeping. First, um, well, not a housekeeping, but a land acknowledgement. I would like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from North Delta in British Columbia, which is the shared traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Stawasan and Musqueam and other Coast Salish people. As I looked out my window this morning, I have massive cedar trees around me and the fall foliage. I was thinking to myself how fortunate I am and I am appreciative of these First Nations for the opportunity to be with you today from this land. I invite you individually to, to reflect on your own land acknowledgement. And if that's something new for you after today, maybe look that up on Google about where you are situated and the lands that you're, you're on. So last year, oh, actually, sorry, I'll step back. Just one more logistics that Jennifer will, so I can help out Jennifer. This is uh, the CSPDM webinar for the generational effects of abuse and trauma on indigenous mental health. You will receive a Zoom notification one day after the webinar that is your confirmation of attendance and your 1.5 CECs. So it will come from Zoom uh, with the title of the webinar and that is what you can use going forward for your CEC requirements. Did I get that right, Jennifer? All right. Some other just ideas around the format here. It's, uh, it's an intimate discussion um, that I'm going to have with, with Irene and as we listen to, to what Irene has to say uh, and share her, her stories. There is no PowerPoint presentation today. The webinar is recorded and will be kept on the CSPDM website if you would like to go back and revisit it. Uh, as well, um, I think there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And so we invite you to write a question for Irene and I will help facilitate those questions uh, as we go or a little bit later on in the presentation. So last year, the federal government passed legislation to name September 30th as a federal statutory day for the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. This day is meant to encourage deeper reflection, learning and public dialogue on the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. In planning for this September webinar, we thought it was appropriate to build an education around this day as a time for us to come together as a community of learning, of learners. 
I am stepping out of my comfort zone. I'll be honest, as is Irene. (laughs) Uh, But it's important to do this and it's important that we do it together and, and, and share our learnings and uh, as we grow in this area and learn about what we can do individually and in this context within our work to support Indigenous workers. Uh, in preparing for today, I, I thought back to my very first job as a registered nurse in Edmonton at the Charles Campbell Community Hospital. When I worked there, I worked pediatrics and and the majority of our patients were First Nations. I did not know at the time, uh, until many years later actually, that that was a government run Indian hospital prior Mm -hmm. to me being there. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I have since gone back and learned, but it did make me reflect on, you know, that young person with without knowledge of the history and my biases uh, that I think of now um, that I learned from. And I guess that's the point I, uh, and that's what I invite all of you today to do as you listen to Irene share her story and her experience and knowledge. Think about what that means for, for you and in the roles that you play as you support Uh, some of your workers, some of the employees, your colleagues uh, who may be Indigenous and and are struggling with illness or injury and we're supporting them through our our work as disability management professionals. Um, I took a look at our standards and I just wanted to point out a couple of the standards that we as disability management professionals uh, need to meet. And one of those is around communication. And we have a standard and a responsibility to communicate with persons from different ethnic and cultural backgrounds and be able to identify systemic barriers and cultural issues related to injury and disability that may impact a worker's ability to return to work. This webinar is going to touch on those those standards. Uh, We recognize this may be uncomfortable for people and may bring up strong feelings and emotions for you. Please reach out to community support if that's, uh, you know, if you're impacted by some of the the things that are being said today. And if you are of Indigenous uh, identity, then you can certainly contact the National Indian Residential School Crisis Line and we'll put that, um, Jennifer, actually, no, I'm going to say I'll put that up in the chat box somehow. I'll send you the, the number, the phone number, and Jennifer will send that out. So, so recognizing all of that, I would like to introduce Irene Robinson. I am very honored to have been working with Irene over the last couple of months uh, mm-hmm. as we, we adventure on this journey together here. Irene is a Tishat woman of the Nichanup Tribal Council. She currently works as a Kwasa outreach wellness worker with the Tishat Mental Health Services. Irene is a mother of eight, a grandmother of six, and was born in Port Alberni. She comes from a family of 10 girls and one boy and numerous foster children and grew up across the fence from the Port Alberni Residential School, which later became the Port Alberni Student Residence. Her parents and grandparents attended residential school and she grew up experiencing firsthand the generational effects of residential school. While she and her siblings did not attend residential school, she watched her parents feed and hide children who were running away from that school and knocking on their door. In her late teens and early 20s, Irene was involved with the Native Alliance for Red Power, experiencing a time when racism was not only acceptable, but practiced openly. Irene became involved with the Native Alliance for this Red Power, 
The organization empowered her and contributed to her growth by challenging the status quo in Indigenous and settler thinking of that time. Irene has a Bachelor of Arts in First Nation Studies with distinction from Malaspina University College, which is now Vancouver mm -hmm. Island University. She has taken many courses in peer counseling, healing, touch, suicide prevention, sexual abuse, family violence, first aid and core training. And with that, without further ado, I am so pleased to introduce Irene Robinson. Thank you, Lanny. And um, just one um, note, it's uh, tea chuck. You. you said to show it a second time. It's um, NT New China Tribal Council, then Teachak Department, then Kuasa. Thank you. And we were practicing. I was practicing, but thank you. I and I have just had to keep practicing. <clears throat> you did excellent. This is a different language. <laughs> okay. Uklama Glorious Tishak Sub Ishnichana that um Mamakni MT Irene Robinson. I'm a Tsashat woman of the Nichanath Tribal Council. My Kuas MT is uh, Ployas. It comes from my dad's mother and it means calms rough waters. Um, I was a bit nervous um, coming here because I have not been involved in anything around um, disability really. Um, we have people on the reserve who have disabilities, um, but they're not treated differently. Um, one, one of the young ladies is part of the singing group now. She sings and drums. Uh, another just graduated high school. Um, they're, they're treated just like we would treat everyone else. If they want help, they'll ask for it and we'll be there. Um, I would like uh, to say a prayer. I think I would. <laughs> it's gone from my head. Nachitayan hawir. Wikshahapin. Apschiku kopin tashi. Klifu kopin nas. What um, this prayer was recorded by um, Sapir in the early 1900s. It happened at an Aitstutha, uh, which is a coming of age for a young girl of the Hupachusit First Nation. Um, her um, grandpa was Tatoosh. I mean, her father was Tatoosh. Um, and he was having this coming of age and from our side of the family, my mother's father's father, um, he was Gallic, Seymour Gallic and Charlie Cludesy were up on the floor at the potlatch talking and Qualats, um, the little boy, he is my grandfather, but he was about three then. Kids were not supposed to be up, but he was up with his dad holding on to his legs and circling, you know, kids circle around legs. And he fell over a power saw. They had three power saws on the uh, floor that they were giving to Tatoosh um, to do whatever he wanted for the, the um, Aitstusha. And he fell, he fell over the power saw, and that's a huge mistake, huge. There, he's not supposed to be up in the first place. So um, immediately, um, Seymour uh, did a chant. A chant stops everything that's happening. He did a chant, and then he sent some people back home, which is just up the river, and um, he started his wealth giving song. 
and his daughter danced for him. And then when she finished dancing, uh, 50 cent pieces were given out to all the Hupachas at present. And um, it, it was a form of apology. And by the time they finished that, the two um, people had come back from up the river and they brought in a horse and put it in the center of the floor and they brought in a canoe and put it in the center of the floor. And um, Seymour said, this is placed under the one who stumbled. This is how important it was. When you think of a horse and a canoe at that time, what were they? They were transportation. If, if my child stumbled on the floor, am I going to go get my car and my boat and bring it in and give it to the host? It's hard to say that I would because, uh, first place, I don't have a canoe. <laughs> but um, it's a different world we've grown up in. And um, although we know these things happened, we're now living in two worlds. And um, depending on making money, to make a, a dollar and um, it's harder to say that we would do this, but it's important to know that we did. And um, I'd like to um, welcome everyone. I know you're sitting um, in your territory and Lanny has talked about this in a great way. And um, I'd like to welcome you to my traditional territory. This is um, uh, where Tshashat people lived. I remember my grandfather standing on the hill outside his house and he told dad, I was just a little girl, he reached out to the mountain and he went, all this land right down to the river belongs to Tshashat. And uh, so this is where our people, we, we actually grew up down the Broken Group Islands. Well, my parents did, but that's where our creation story comes from. And that's where the name Tshashat comes from. Tshashat means um, the people of the stinky place. <laughs> and um, what the stinky place actually refers to is whale hunting and how the beach um, got a very strong odor when they were harvesting whales. And Tshashat were known for their whale hunting. Because we were right on the Pacific, the island we were on was right on the Pacific. Okay, um, I wanted to start with um, Auntie Alice Paul. She's Heshkweksa. And one of the quotes I keep from her is, the highest law of the land was the ultimate protection of the children. A number one law, protect the children. And um, something else that was important to us is um, the word hish, uh, hishuk ish tawak. And that means everything is one. We are all interconnected. Everything has life. Um, the trees out here, we couldn't live without them. The ground, the rocks, they have a role in what we do. Everything is, um, all the animals, all the life is in a circle, maintaining balance. Hishuk ish sawak. And when you um, do something to one part of it, the balance is gone. Okay. I also wanted to um, talk about um, a couple of things here. I started with mental illness. I had to look things up because like I say, I'm nervous. I've not done this before. Um, I've worked with residential school, but not with this. 
And I got mental illness is a disorder that can cause psychological and behavioral disturbances with varying severity. The symptoms are confusion, depression, social withdrawal, and extreme feelings of pleasure, anger, excitement, grief, or fear. And um, I don't know if everyone's read the um, United Nations definition of genocide, because I like to, um, I'm a truth teller. What I know to be true, I will talk about, even if nobody else thinks it's true, I will talk about it. Um, and to the United Nations, they say any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethical, racial, or religious group, such as killing members in the group, um, or it's also causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of a group. And with that, you know, like, like we went through the whole foster care systems, uh, 60s scoop, uh, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. And the residential school, according to Duncan Campbell Scott, was meant to kill the Indian and the child. Um, imposing measures intended to prevent births within a group. And at one point, there was a sterilization program in the residential schools. Forcefully transferring children to the group from one group to another group. And Father Paul Lejeune in the 16th century, when they first started talking about residential schools, um, that is what he said, you had to take the children away from the parents, take them far away and keep them for lengths of time. And this was to civilize the savages. But what it actually was, was um, they were molding the children. They couldn't sway the elders. They couldn't sway the adults. They knew who they were. They knew where they belonged. So they took the children and um, changed the children. And, um, the other one that I really looked at was epigenetic change. It says trauma alters certain genetic markers, and this is passed on through generations and leads to trauma, grief, depression, and abuse. Um, okay. I'm, because I was so nervous, I made a lot of notes and I'm going to try not to use them because I don't usually use so much notes, but um, um, I want to talk about traditional parenting. Um, my mother used to tell me this story about her younger sister. When her younger sister was born, um, one day, her dad and his brother rushed into the house and said, they're coming today. That's all they had to say. And they went downtown, bought things for lunch, bought things for gifts and came back to the house. And um, so my grandmother, she started cooking right away. And the uh, elders on the reserve went up to Nanny Katie's house, which is, our house was here. There was a field and a little hill and Nanny Katie lived up there and the elders gathered there. And um, they came down the hill and across the field. The men were singing and drumming and the women at that time all wore aprons, fancy aprons, they had beautiful aprons, but they grabbed the lower part of the apron and they lifted it and danced behind the men as they came to the house. And they were met at the door and brought in and seated. Then um, my mother's younger sister, Shan, was brought out. It's just a baby, and she was put um, to the first elder. And she was passed around the circle of elders, and they each said something to her. Some of them welcomed her to the family. Some of them 
told her, you know, you're going to be a great woman, you know, this is what you're going to do. Um, others uh, sang uh, which are baby songs. Some people compare them to lullabies, but they're um, more than lullabies. They're um, teaching songs as well as, as part of Aastumkwa. And um, sometimes they were given their first name. Mom called it a nickname um, for, um, um, geez, I can't think of an example right now. <laughs> oh, um, one of the guys from the um, Hoopachusett Reserve, which we share the valley with, um, he called his first son Quis. And Quis means snow. And when he was born, snow was falling. So that was his first name. And we don't keep the same name all through our lives. In the past, we haven't. Um, we got a baby name, then a young person name, then an adult name and an elder name. And um, the names uh, were family owned. And so if you ever met someone with the same name as you, you knew they were part of your family. Even if they were from two villages away, there had been some connection in there and they were part of your family. And relationships were so um, prized and held. I don't have that um, talent, but one of my daughters does. And she can tell you when you, she hears a name, she can tell you where they came from. And my late mother-in-law was fantastic at that. Would say, well, who's Vicki Smith, mom um, or grandma? And she would go back. Oh, that's so-and-so's um, first daughter. She was married and then she left him and she married again. And that's her third daughter. But she could go back like this. And I always find it fascinating. But our relationships were really important because when we traveled, we didn't have 7-Eleven to stop at. Um, we didn't have a hotel to sleep overnight in. So you stopped on the beach of your relative. They took you in, fed you, um, housed you until whatever it was you were there doing was over. Um, so um, when a, a woman became pregnant, there were things that she couldn't do. Um, she couldn't go to anything that had a negative energy. Uh, like a funeral. She couldn't go because of the bad energy there and anything around the mom would affect the baby. And um, she couldn't, um, there's, I think they call them chitons. They're little black um, animals that stick to stones, rocks right at the edge of the, where the um, land meets the water in salt water and they're it's really hard to see them the first time I went picking them um, they gave me a, a butter knife and they said they're just on the rocks there well I went and looked on the rocks I couldn't see a darn thing except rocks and I had to have someone come over because I was almost crying now and uh, someone came over and showed me on the rock where this high ship was and she showed me how to flick it off the rock. But after that, I was able to look and find some. But she couldn't uh, have Hayushtup because the baby would stick to the inside of her stomach. Uh, the placenta wouldn't come out or, or something would stick. And it was dangerous uh, for the mom and the baby. So you couldn't eat Hayushtup. Um, you couldn't eat um, hasam, it's a crab, uh, because then um, the baby would walk funny, like sideways or something when they were, were growing up. And um, the husband um, supported his wife by not eating what she couldn't eat. And that was a way to bring them closer together during this time.
Okay. Um, children were taught very gently, very kindly. And um, they were taught, we didn't have classrooms the way it was done in Europe. We didn't have to sit in desks facing somebody and uh, being right or wrong. Um, the teaching was done by your parents, by your aunts, uncles, by your grandparents. Grandparents were often during the evening through storytelling and stories could last one night, one week or one month. And that the children would be listening to those stories. And um, the mother and father um, started off um, very kindly uh, raising their baby. And then the grandparent, the grand, the aunties and uncles would take over and they would, uh, I don't know if any of you had children who didn't want to listen to you, but they'd listen to your sister. Th yeah, that's how we worked. <laughs> and um, in the longhouse, we lived in longhouses, was the family, the grandparents, their children, their uh, children's spouses and their grandchildren all lived in one house. And it was easy for the children to watch how the adults behaved and then the, to take their cue on how to behave from that. Um, if anybody uh, was doing something that was causing any kind of disturbance, they would, what they call, sit them down. And they'd be in the middle of elders. Elders would surround them and elders would talk to them. And um, they were, they were, it was never said like, um, you did wrong, you shouldn't have done that. Never anything like that. They would just um, sometimes tell stories that demonstrated that. Or sometimes um, their words were made to be easily receptible. So nobody felt bad about being sat down. They knew that something happened, but they were able to be taught. And the children um, saw this and, and saw um, that you could solve things without arguing. Um, so the teaching that was done was um, your mom or dad or aunt or uncle would take you out. Let's go for a walk. Oh, let's pick berries. But first, during the winter, before you picked berries, you learned how to make a berry picking basket. You sat with your mom or your auntie, and um, they showed you. And they um, included in that the teachings of spirituality, the thankfulness for the roots or the uh, um, cedar bark or, or whatever you were making your basket with, being thankful that they gave their life so that you could uh, pick berries in them. And um, that was part of the teaching and also showing the children where on our territory um, were the blackberries, uh, where on the territory were our cedar bark trees that we could harvest. Um, and there was always someone who looked after. So someone looked after the berry bushes and what that means is um, they would go where the berry bushes were and pull out the new little roots that weren't berry bushes or were getting too thick. They would weed it out. The people who looked after the streams would go and take out uh, branches that had fallen in there, or leaves that had um, collected in one spot so that the fish could go up easy. And all the time that they were there, with their relative, they were learning, they were being taught. Um, Les Sam has told me that um, when he went down the canal with his dad, all the way down, his dad would say, and this territory here, that's our territory. And it'd tell him where it's from, or this rock here, that's the best place to get halibut. So all the way down, he'd be talking to him teaching him uh, very gently and, and we could have fun while we learned. You know, it, it was, um, 
it was very different from the classrooms I sat in. And I, I got a chance to experience that because in 1950, uh, it was dropped from the Indian Act that, um, 51, um, it was dropped from the Indian Act that you couldn't sing or dance or wear regalia. It had been against the law of Canada for us to sing or dance or wear regalia. So um, that was dropped. And shortly after that, my mother invited my uncle who was a singer and he carried songs at a time when it was illegal to carry songs. It was illegal to sing. Uh, the old ladies came and taught us to dance and they kept that knowledge when it was illegal. Uh, so it wasn't always easy, but we're so glad we had people who hung on to knowledge even when it was dangerous to do so. Um, so mom brought these people in and they taught us how to sing and dance, me and my sisters. And um, what I, I always used to say, um, these old ladies saved me. My mom was a residential school survivor. So was my dad and my grandma and grandpa. And uh, my mom was a raging residential school survivor. Her mother was a raging residential school survivor. And what I mean by that is uh, mom always yelled at us. She, she didn't know how not to. She was raised by the, the um, people at the residential school, the supervisors. That's who her parents became after once she started going there. She didn't know how not to yell at me. She didn't know that she shouldn't be hitting me, punching me, kicking me. She didn't know because that's how she was raised, raised and that was the norm for them. This was how they knew to treat children from where they were growing up. Um, so, um, when we had our, our dance practice at night, my mom was always in a good mood and we baked, we, um, made sandwiches, coffee, tea for, so when the elders came, we would be serving them and making sure they were okay, um, before we started practicing and during that. And those, um, elders were so kind they were so gentle. They were um, always smiling. They laughed while they taught us. There was times to be serious, but there were times to laugh too. And uh, um, so these people showed me what it was to be traditionally brought up, what it was, um, to be treated in a kind way. And um, that to know that they loved you. And um, they showed us that um, one of our big trainings with our children was uh, you never held one up above the other. Everybody was on the same level. If someone was really dancing well that night or singing well, the elder would come along, put a hand on your shoulder and pull you aside. And she'd just say, you're doing really well tonight. Chach. And chach was an endearment, like uh, my, uh, my dear one, my um, beautiful daughter, granddaughter. Um, so they'd say, you're doing really well tonight. Chach. And that would be out of range of my sister's so that I was the only one hearing this. But it made me feel good that they were noticing, that they were um, um, being there to be supportive. And if um, you were playing around, which you shouldn't be, um, they might sit just down and tell us a story about Raven and how he was playing around and made a mess of something, you know? They'd tell us a story about that so that we could see that we needed to change our behavior. So, um,
they taught us. And, and one thing that they noticed was the elders could see um, um, what your talents were. We all came to this world with talents, uh, gifts that would help us on our, our journey because we're here, um, we're on a journey and we have a purpose to that journey. And um, they came um, to this earth and the elders could see what their purpose was. And they started training them in, everybody got training, but if your gift was um, a singer, then they would put you um, with someone who was a good singer so that they could teach you and you would learn. And because it was something that you were gifted, you met with success, always met with success. And it was a happy learning environment. Um, there was no one right answer, no one wrong answer. Um, and we could see it with the elders when they had meetings, elders meetings. Uh, they would meet, but they would never say, um, oh, Auntie Alice, you're the, the um, most knowledgeable here. Can you uh, tell us what this is? They never did that. They just said, okay, today we're going to talk about family. And then they'd go around the circle and everyone would say what they uh, knew about family and how to raise family. So um, in learning this way, they um, learned who they were, which family they belonged to, and um, where they belonged. Uh, and that's so important to have that. And that's one of the things residential school took away. Okay, um, there was uh, Father Paul Lejeune. He was a 16th century um, Jesuit priest. And um, they were, they had like, since contact, been trying to um, talk to the elders and uh, adults and trying to make them say they didn't own anything that, um, yeah, go ahead and take it. We don't own it. Um, they'd been trying to do that with no success. So then they turned to the children. You can mold children. And what Father Paul Lejeune said was, um, you have to take the child there while they are young. You have to take them far away from their parents so the parents couldn't stop anything you were doing. Um, you had to keep them away for long periods of time so that they wouldn't have any interference with what they were saying or doing to the child. Uh, and so this was the beginning of residential school. And it was um, worked through the churches and the government. And the government was the... Uh, strong and um, the, excuse me, the churches were second only to the government at that time. So the, the churches uh, went out and established residential schools. These residential schools, they were, the public was told they were um, providing an education for the savage children and um, that they were doing it free of charge. So this sounded to the public like we were getting something wonderful and we didn't even have to pay for it. But the residential schools weren't like that. They didn't give much money to the residential schools. Um, in the um, there's a comparison, I can't remember what book it's in now, but it looked at, at that time, the different kinds of schools there were, like religious schools, uh, schools for the deaf, um, schools for orphans, 
uh, there was a list of schools and residential school was right on the bottom with how much money they got. And they were at least $200 below what the others were. The, when the last, last um, group had their money, we were $200 below that. So the schools that were built, um, excuse me, were very um, poor. Um, often the toilets went right into the basement. Um, so that diseases came in that way. Um, there was holes in the walls. Uh, they were just very poorly constructed. Um, they didn't have much money. And um, this was just the way it was. And then they made it legal in the Indian Act. They said any child between five and uh, 16 had to attend residential school, had to, any Indian child. And uh, the parents couldn't um, keep their children away. The parents would be um, jailed or um, fined if they didn't send their kids to residential school. And um, the kids didn't know this. And the supervisors used this against the parents by saying, your parents don't love you. If they loved you, would they send you here? Your parents don't even want you. They sent you here for 10 months out of the year. And um, the children were told daily, these, these um, little things, we're the only ones who want you. We're the only ones who care about you. And then they proceed to um, tell them they can't speak their language. Uh, my my um, uncle, he had, when he spoke his language, he had a sewing needle pushed through his tongue for speaking his language. He was a little boy. He didn't know English very well. But this is what was done to him because he spoke his language. My cousin, he told us at a meeting, he said that he, he his two older siblings went to residential school and he was so jealous that they got to go. He had no idea what residential, residential school was like because there was a code of silence in the residential school. You weren't to talk. If you talked, you got punished. So, his parents didn't talk about it. His brother and sister didn't talk about it. And he kept saying, I want to go. I want to go. And um, so finally it was his turn. And he went to the residential school. And they walked up the stairs. And they were met um, by the supervisor. Um, the supervisor grabbed the child grabbed this little boy's hand and pulled him. And he, he started going, but then he stopped and he tried to get back to his parents and his parents turned their back and walked away because they knew the law. They knew what was saying. They knew they had to leave their child there. And this little boy was taken and um, he was stripped. All his clothes were taken off him. And the supervisors, not a doctor, the supervisors used their hands, feeling him all over. And um, they used their fingers in his orifices everywhere. Um, and then when they were um, finished with that, he had this delousing powder put on him. And then they used a fire hose to wash it off. And then um, he's, by this time, he's scared. He doesn't know what's going on. 
he's wetting himself. He, he's just scared. And he's, he's been separated from his brothers and sisters. So he's alone. And they take him naked and walk him across the school to where he gets his clothes from the school. And on these clothes is a number. And from that point on, he is known as that number. My, uh, I worked at um, Gatsgaman, which is um, a family treatment center. And we went up to where the residential school was here. And one of our uh, band members had made a memorial. And part of that memorial was this board that had numbers all over it. And one of our um, people who were in treatment, he was going around there and then he stopped and he didn't move. He just stopped. And um, they said, you better go see him. So I went over. He was already uh, surrounded by about six people. And I said, what's the matter? And he's just looking. And he finally said, number 17, that's me. And um, he stood by this board and looked at who he was. That was who he was, number 17. And being a number, I, I, I watched this um, video about these guys on Tuper Island. And they said that, um, they would all be playing out in the schoolyard, and but they weren't having fun. He said, we didn't have fun until the supervisor came out and yelled a number, and that number had to go. And he said, after that number went, um, then they could relax and they could play. And what that number calling meant was that that was who was going to be sexually abused that afternoon. So um, by dehumanizing them with the number, I don't know if that made it easier for them or what, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, um, I forgot to mention that um, in the village, everyone had jobs. And um, like, say you're doing fish. Well, the, the um, little kids um, who are old enough now to work, um, they would gather um, wood from the beach for the smokehouse fire. Um, they would take the stomachs as the, they were cleaned, the fish were clean, and they would uh, wash them out. And then they would put eggs in there and that would hang in the smokehouse. And um, it, my mom said it tasted like cheese, <laughs> but uh, yeah, but everybody had a job and a lot of it was around um, food because food was important. Hey? You had to, no fridges, you had to make things that would last. So everybody's job was important and no one was looked down on. Um, I started reading about epigenetics. I know we're kind of running out of time, hey? I haven't even got to what I wanted to do. <laughs> um, no, we're good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I, I started reading and watching um, videos about epigenetics. And one thing that they said right in the beginning, um, like everything is accepted um, un until something is accepted, it's the unknown and un un unacceptable. And when epigenetics first came, no one thought it was important. No one in um, the scientific community, people hated epigenetics. They hated the, the workers and the workers became outcasts but they believed in their study and they went ahead. Um, and what they believed was the environment has impacts that um, uh, will lead to diseases or modifying your DNA. The air we breathe and the food we eat regulates the genes, whether they're turned on or off. 
And when I, I think about experiments, that really hurts me because, um, you know, they're um, experimenting on live creatures. Uh, in this one, they used mice and they used ants. And um, it, um, I told you about Hishukish Zawak, we're all one. Um, we're all alive. We all live in this balance together. And um, they experimented on mice. And um, the experiment, they had two um, same female mice. And um, the one mo mother they gave uh, unhealthy diets to, and the other ones were given healthy diets. And then they watched them. And, and that's the part it, it um, I know it's the way they do it, but it, it just, it hurts. So um, the mother who fed was fed a healthy diet, her offspring were um, brown, like the moms were brown. Her offspring were brown. They were fast. Um, and they were trim for their lives. They were trim. The mother who had the unhealthy diet, her babies were born with a, a tawny color, like a tan. And her babies were slow. And um, a lot of them developed diabetes or cancer. So the, they were looking at the, the way the diet will affect. And like our people before residential school had a healthy diet. But um, mom talked about having to eat um, oatmeal with rat droppings in it, having to eat um, meat that was green and fuzzy. Um, my auntie said that the best meal of the whole week was Sunday supper. And that was a half a slice of bologna, a boiled egg, a piece of bread with lard on it, and an apple or an orange. That was the best meal of their whole week. And um, the children uh, at residential school, they worked. They weren't going to school, they were working, especially in the beginning. Uh, they kept the farm, they um, washed and scrubbed in the uh, school. And so they had all this food from the farm and the children, while they're having their oatmeal with rat droppings in it, they were bringing food, cooking food and bringing food to the supervisors who were having eggs and bacon who are having the chicken, uh, who are having pork, while they were in the other room eating whatever it was they could. And uh, a lady I met, she said that uh, she's from Kamloops. And um, when the schools closed, uh, uh, one of the people on the reserve opened a restaurant in the basement where the kitchen was. And she was all excited. She said, oh, I'm going to pick up mom. I'll bring her to the new restaurant. So she went and picked up her mom and they went and um, they started down the stairs. She'd been walking with her mom and talking and never noticed when her mom stopped. And her mom had stopped halfway down the stairs. And she went up to her. She said, mom, what's the matter? Because she's just standing there and staring. And her mom pointed to a post in the middle of the room and she said, that's where that young girl was thrown. She wouldn't eat the food. So they grabbed her, one of the uh, supervisors and threw her against that post. That young girl hit the post, slid down and sat there and she just stared for a while. And then after she sat there for a while, she got up, went to the table and ate the food. And uh, yeah, there's, there's stories all over and people never believed us. They thought that um, 
our survivors were making up stories. And uh, they, um, they were made fun of our survivors are trying to tell their stories. Um, but that changed last year with 215 from Kamloops. People started to listen and to believe, but I don't know if they know what to do, what they can do, what they can change. And that's a, that's a big thing. What can I change? How can I um, do something different? And that's where um, Orange Shirt Day started. And um, for myself, I recognize Orange Shirt Day, which is the 30th of September, before I recognize Truth and Reconciliation Day. Orange Shirt Day is from our people. It's from Phyllis Webstad, who grew up with her grandmother her grandmother didn't have money. There was no welfare. So um, Phyllis had to go to school. And the day before she was to leave, her grandmother brought her to town. She said she didn't know where her grandma got the money, but she got her a new outfit. And she got um, pants and shoes. And she was allowed to pick out her clothes. And she chose this beautiful orange shirt. It had a, a little... Um, opening here that was laced up and it had glitter around it. It was just beautiful and she loved it. So she um, wore it to the residential school where it was immediately taken away from her. She uh, never got it back, but she uh, saw other children wearing her orange shirt, but she couldn't say anything. Even when she left there, uh, they didn't give her her orange shirt back. And um, I, I prefer to recognize our people um, because I know in studying Europe that when they took over, uh, when someone took over, um, they got rid of holidays and uh, days of celebration for the, the people, grassroots people harvest when they harvested and had a, a big celebration they took that away and they changed it they changed it into things like uh, halloween or thanksgiving things that were acceptable to them but weren't recognizing what the grassroots people were recognizing and the grassroots people were happy just to be able to celebrate so they accepted it and um so when on September 30th, I celebrate Orange Shirt Day. I celebrate um, the survivors and also recognize those who didn't survive, the 215. People didn't want to believe about unmarked graves, and they're called unmarked graves. They were crime scene. This was murder. Children were killed and nobody paid attention. There's a story from our residential school on reserve that, no, it wasn't ours, but it was on our reserve. A young girl was there and she was running up and down the stairs. She was crying and crying, calling her mother and the supervisor was chasing her up and down, up and down. And the principal came out and said, what's going on? And the lady said, she won't stop crying. I can't catch her. And she was running up the stairs at that time. The principal turned, kicked her hard in the stomach, and that girl went down the stairs. She hit the bottom of the stairs and didn't move. There was another young girl in that room. She was hiding. She was crying. And you couldn't cry. You were punished, you were a baby, you couldn't cry. So she found a place to hide down at the bottom of the stairs where she could cry to herself. And she watched this whole thing. And as she sat there, the principal and the supervisor walked away. This little girl was laying unmoving at the bottom of the stairs. 
she was staring and she had blood coming out of her mouth. And this little girl um, didn't move for two hours and no one came. So um, it, there was murder, yet nobody calls it that. They call them deaths, they call them unmarked graves. But it was our children and they were murdered. So anyway, um, I got away from epigenetics. So I, uh, what time is it? Excuse me. Lanny. Just, just uh, after nine. after nine. It is. I, you know, I'm just, um, uh, your stories are so powerful and I, I'm just absorbed listening to you as always and provide that that context of of you know what people who are uh, where well, you talked about your mother being a, a raging survivor and that's where the epigenetics comes in that you're talking about the the, the raging survivor is is passed on to you yeah it was and and you talk about have talked to me about you know your parenting of your children yeah being passed along and seeing your children now with their children and the the change is yeah. coming um but slow to unlearn or to to learn differently yeah right so the the impacts that has on on people who are, are in well working today. Right? Yeah. So if we think about and I guess that's a question I have for you is is so as disability management professionals, we work with with workers of all ages, you know, from kind of you know 20 to 65, maybe you know, in general, that's the vast majority. So it's a um, but knowing uh, you know, how can we use this information and how might this trauma that people are experiencing, the generational trauma, how might that show up in a worker that we're trying to, you know, support? You know, we all are we're coming from a good place, but we don't necessarily understand what are some of those, the ways it might show up that um, for if we're working with Indigenous person who's disabled and trying to help them get back to work? Um, you, you might see a lot of anger. Um, and um, the, the code of silence from the residential school, they may have a hard time talking. Um, you could see people who have a fear of authority. That, that was a big thing with me fear of authority. I could never challenge anyone from the principal of the school to the lady at the bank. They were all authority figures to me. Um, and especially white people. I was convinced when I was young that native people um, were uh, not good. If you wanted to be good, you had to try be white, but never being able to get to be white. <laughs> um, yeah. And so being gentle, and I, I know it's not easy. I work with our people and I'm Kuas, I'm, I'm native. So um, they often are more open to anything Kuas than they are to anything mainstream. So um it, it might be hard for you, but please don't give up on them. They're, they come from a place where um, they feel like they're, um, they're, they're wrong. Nothing's right about them. They're wrong. They come from a place where they're, they are very sure that everybody else is better than them. Uh, they come from a place where they're scared to try new things. 
And they may not know it, but that was residential school stuff. You tried something and you didn't get it done properly, uh, you were punished. Uh, you were made fun of in front of everybody. Um, and everybody had to laugh at you. If they didn't laugh at you and make fun of you, they were next. So um, often um, feelings of not being good enough. And um, it's, it's really hard. Um, what what uh, we were talking about this the other day. And like I said, be gentle. Um, make yourself aware of the um, history, especially of the territory you're sitting on. Um, try to learn a few words in the language of that territory. There's usually um, elders or even young people today who are learning language. Um, you can learn how to say, um, Hello, you can learn how to say um, chu. And chu um, means it's not a, a word. Goodbye isn't in our vocabulary. It's see you later, chu. See you later. Or else it can also mean when we would be pouring tea for the elders, they'd be, if they only wanted half a cup or so, they'd go chu, chu. And that meant that it's, that's enough. That's all I want and um, learn how to say the names of the territory that you sit on. Uh, I, I have to compliment Lanny on um, her pronunciation. She did really well. And she was open and willing. And uh, in, in saying, and uh, true, <laughs> it's it's Nuchanath, so you um, may not hear it wherever you are, you'd be hearing a different word. But even just knowing those first few words, and you empower people when you ask them. Um, I, uh, one of our workers worked in a house, it he was a young guy, and he was down the dock one day because it's a fishing village. And he was down the dock one day and he got off a boat and the skipper threw him the rope and said, tie the boat up. And he's standing there. He's going, I don't know how to tie. I've never been around water or boats, you know. And um, so um, the kids on the dock were laughing and they said, oh, come on. And they showed him how to tie up a boat. That just by doing that and allowing himself to be taught by the kids, he empowered those kids. Those kids knew something and they shared it. And that feeds them and gives them self-assurance. So um, if you have a question um, you, and you, you need to watch the person you're working with. Some of them are open, some of them are not. So gentle, gentle comments, gentle, just small little questions or, you know, um, um, like I hear you say chew when you leave here. What does chew mean, you know? And, and um, like we said, there's no right or wrong answer. They will tell you what they've been taught. And, yeah. Oh, sorry. I would... <laughs> Um, one of the things that um, I hadn't thought about, um, and for my colleagues, I hadn't thought about how we may come across as those authority figures and um, uh, versus someone who is, you know, we think we're here to, to really try to help, but we may be coming across as that authority figure and and invoke either that silence from individuals or that withdrawal and and say so being curious I guess is what I come back to and it's one of my favorite words when I'm, I'm speaking to colleagues about disability management be curious and and kind yeah and kind people can see you may not think they're reading you but they've had a lifetime 
of watching other people and how are they going to remain safe around these other people? How are they not going to look like an idiot? Because oftentimes they feel like they are because they've been told over and over, you're so dumb. You know, why can't you do this? It's so easy. Um, they've been told that. So they believe it when you're, um, what's his name now? Adolf Hitler. He said, if you tell a lie loud enough and often enough, people will believe you. And these children, uh, when they were children, were told how stupid they were, um, how they couldn't do anything right, how they'd never amount to anything, how they were just going to be a drunk anyway. So why are we teaching you? You know, they've been growing up hearing those kinds of things. And um, just be very open. Be willing to listen to what they say. Um, and if, you, you, if you're curious, say, you know, um, um, in working with you, I'm just curious. Um, what can I do? Or, or where can I learn? Um, more, more to help you. Um, is there a place where I can talk to elders? You know, do you know? Or, be, and that even that can make someone pull back. Where can I learn? People just assuming that because you're native, you know where it is. Um, I have a couple of comments for you here in the, in okay. our chat box or question box here. So one says, Irene. You are a giant. There is so much I have to learn and appreciate your presentation that hopefully has made me more sensitive and understanding. Thank you. You are so courageous. Um, and a comment or one a question, um, which is, you know, in, in um, I think you had mentioned early in, in your, your conversation about living in two worlds. Well, and, and of course, we, we do, you know, in terms of thinking about our, our as disability management, working, you know, with the healthcare system as it's structured, the Western yeah. medicine, uh, you know, and, and that's what, you know, insurance claims recognize the treatment, the, you know, the, the recognized treatment under your benefit plan. So here's a question around that. Um, in our practice as disability managers and working with our clients, they need to be, you know, in quotes, appropriate treatment to qualify for benefits. Do you have any recommendations to share about culturally based treatment that we may not be aware of, but could be of support, a supporter for treatment? Okay, I would um, go to the friendship centers if there's a friendship center close to you. If there's a First Nation, like especially if it's um, uh, like we're the Nuchanath Tribal Council, we're made out of 14 First Nations. So mm -hmm. if there's a central um, region, um, they probably have a social worker or, or something like that and ask them, you know, um, we're not only where can I send these people if they want to go, but how can I learn more to be supportive? And um, um, that, that's what I'd say mm -hmm. is, is you got to find out. And um, there's the, I don't know about other places, but we have the BC Residential School hotline here mm -hmm. and you can phone there, you know, um, just like you say, be curious. Get on that Google or whatever you do. With. <laughs> well, that's it. I, you know, I was doing. I've been doing a lot of that, and and you know, the, the yeah, the different websites. Um, I think that that's that's actually the friendship. Really good, really good um, advice. I hadn't thought about that one. Um, but I think there are a, a number of ways for us and that's that is and it's it's a good time so I know people in, in, and I appreciate folks comments in the in the chat line here about you know the, themselves learning and and um, you know being grateful for this conversation and this this opportunity for this um, I just wanted to share a couple of 
you know, ways that the groups are making a difference. So here in BC, the the WCAT, which is the uh, appeal tribunal for our WorkSafe BC claims and appeals, have done an extensive um, have done extensive work around this in how they support uh, individuals who identify as Indigenous to go through that that appeal process, which is very, um, you know, hierarchical. It's you're sitting in front of a vice chair telling your story, but working with Indigenous elders, they've created a system where they now have um, navigators to help Indigenous workers go through the appeal process. They will change the seating environment where they will, instead of having your typical long table with the chair at the head and people on the side, they will use a round table for more dialogue and discussion. They have removed pictures, uh, you know, colonial type pictures from the walls. So creating a safer space, um, you know, and in response to um, the question around treatment centers with the BC Nurses Union, we had, um, we worked with a nurse with severe addiction and our insurance provider is, is Canada Life. And with, with a lot of col collaboration and joint efforts, we were able to get to make sure that her funding continued for her benefits while she attended uh, you know, a specific treatment in Saskatchewan with her father for this indigenous treatment. Because other treatments are traditional, you know, Western residential treatment centers were not working. No, but she we were able to get her benefits continued while she went through this, let's say non-traditional or non-recognized by benefits. Um, type treatment. So I think there's ways to have some of those those conversations and the time is right. Yeah. Um, I would say for that and for us to as disability management professionals to lead in in that way to to start those conversations and you know many organizations of course are are looking at their policies and procedures and so again uh, our, the time is right for us to do that. Uh, I was just checking the chat line here for um, could yeah. I say something. Um, I just want to recognize and thank all the people who came, who attended and who listened. And um, uh, what you're doing is, is huge. What you're doing and, and so kindly and from your heart is going to help. And um, I also, uh, I told some stories here that uh, were hard. And I want people to look after themselves. And you can look after yourself by um, grounding. I don't know if everyone knows what grounding is, but you can stand or even sit and um, just balance yourself. Put your arms out with your palms up and do deep breathing and feel that breath go all through your body, right down to your toes. Feel it come back up and out. You do this slowly and it helps to bring you back down. You can go like here is perfect. You can go outside and put bare feet on the grass and um, do deep breathing or um, meditate. But you're, you're in connection with mother earth. You can go to the water, you can go to the trees. I remember one time I was so tired. I was walking down the road and my feet were just dragging. And I could hear this voice in my, said, in my head say, put your hands on the trees. And I'm going, yeah, yeah. And I just kept going. And then I heard again, put your hands on the trees. And I said, yeah, sure. And I kept going. And the third time I heard in here, it said, put your hands on the trees. So they don't give up on you. Hey? put your hands on the trees. I said, okay. So I went down, there was trees down a little hill on the road. So I went down and put my hands on the trees. As soon as I put my hands on the trees, I could feel energy just shooting through my body. The energy, the tree was giving me energy. And I stayed like that for about four or five minutes. 
And when I took my hands down, I wasn't tired anymore. The tree had shared its energy with me because it knew we were in that balanced part. So I, I just want to thank everyone who was here today. And please look after yourself. Oh, that's such an important message. I, and thank you for sharing that. And you know what, as you were talking, I was looking at the corner of my eye, just at my, my massive cedar. And, and I often will just go down. There's the branch that comes on way too low now. And it, <laughs> but I can touch it and I can, I can just kind yeah. of stand there. So I, I really, really appreciate that. We're getting so many, so many thank yous in the, in, from the chat line here. And um, there's a, uh, some of the questions about, you know, continued learning. And I just want to let folks know um, that we are, uh, as the board, we're looking at some different programs. And there's one, uh, and we'll send we'll send out some information in an email or actually probably get it onto the website. That's what we'll do, it's the SPDM website. Um, but one of the programs that I took a few years ago that is offered throughout uh, the BC healthcare system for anyone working within healthcare is with Sanya uh, Indigenous Cultural Safety Training. And uh, it, it's an amazing uh, course, um, but, but and it's, it's relevant for uh, for wherever you live in Canada. You, there's different um, programs, but there's, um, so it's not just for BC. But we'll send some information around that as well. Um, and I think I'm just looking at the time, and I yeah, I could keep going, but. <laughs> but we can't, we can't, and I am so grateful um, for for everyone for for joining us to, today and and your comments. Thank you. I will share those uh, with Irene af afterwards. I couldn't share them all. Um, you know, you told me about Irene about a favorite cartoon you have, Calvin and Hobbes. I love Calvin and Hobbes, um, but there's a picture of Calvin and Hobbes, and the quote, you know, it's about sitting in an education and then he's out playing you know his teacher there who they, he can never do but it he the quote is you can present the material but you can't make me care right well yeah, Irene I like that one too you know Irene <laughs> you you presented and and you have you have made this so human and so we all care and okay. and I see by the comments and hear the impact that you've had um, and so uh, I want to to thank you. I want to say Plaku Chu for you. Um, thank you to everyone for attending.